Starting today, I'm moving in with my son, his wife, and their kids. I don't need anyone else. That's what we decided as a family, Ben said in a tone that suggested he wasn't joking. Whoever you are, get out of the house, old lady. We're going to work together as a family, so please leave soon. There's no room for you, as my son and his wife said this, mocking me. They gestured as if to shoo me away, even as I reached my boiling point in anger, yet I managed to calm down. Facing the three of them, I chuckled. It's silly to stand on the same stage as these people, to get provoked and angry. After all, I've been paying $6,000 a month for living expenses, and they've forgotten that and are trying to kick me out. What are they planning to do from now on? Fine, I'll divorce you too. I'll leave as you've said. At my words, the three of them grinned with disgusting smiles. I turned around, left the living room, and secluded myself in my room. Your belongings are trash. Take everything with you. Ben yelled from the living room. Without responding, I silently began packing my things. My name is Sarah. I'm 65 years old. I married Ben and worked part-time, but now I take care of house duties and also work from home. I met Ben through what you might call a pickup. I was a college student at the time. Ben, who was seven years my senior and a working adult, approached me, having fallen in love at first sight. Having no experience with men, I was wary and kept avoiding Ben. But Ben didn't give up and kept talking to me whenever we met. It was often just a greeting, but we'd chat if there was time. I reluctantly listened, but eventually he realized I wasn't interested and said, I didn't mean to bother you. I'm sorry for making you feel uncomfortable. With that, I realized Ben's sincerity and decided to face him. Gradually, I began to be drawn to Ben as well. After we graduated from college, we got married and were blessed with a daughter, Natalie, and a son, Mark. Ben, who loved children, was cooperative in raising our two kids, and we lived happily as a family. However, that happiness didn't last long. When Mark entered middle school, I heard something unbelievable while I was working part-time. It was Rachel, a senior colleague who was a year older than me, who told me. She was close in age, had kids, and was easygoing and caring, so I felt a sense of closeness and liked her. One day, as we were heading home at the same time, she said, You know, I was once picked up at the station a long time ago. That was the station where I met Ben. It was a coincidence that it was a pickup spot, I thought as I listened. Rachel continued, My friends were also picked up by the same guy. It became a topic among us, and after observing for a while, it turned out he was hitting on various girls. What? There's someone like that? I exclaimed. Yeah, it's surprising, and he was only hitting on girls much younger than himself. Rachel laughed, and I laughed along. Rumor has it he finally caught a young girlfriend and got married. At that moment, I had a bad feeling, and somehow I felt embarrassed about meeting Ben here. Ben fell in love with me at first sight and just happened to meet me here. I wanted to believe he was different from those pickup guys, but my hope was shattered. Moreover, he's been telling everyone he fell in love at first sight. Those who were deceived into marriage. Poor things. Rachel continued to speak, but nothing reached me after I sensed that the pickup guy was Ben. I was ashamed of being deceived by Ben's words. Of course, I knew Rachel meant no harm. She didn't know my husband was Ben. Sarah, you look pale. Rachel asked me worriedly as I remained silent. Yeah, I'm fine just thinking about what to make for dinner tonight. It's tough every day, isn't it? I wonder what I should make, too. I managed to change the subject with that, but my mind was full of what I had heard, and I made mistake after mistake at my part-time job. In the afternoon after dinner was over and the kids had gone to bed, I said to Ben, Today, even though I heard something interesting from a friend at work. Interesting? What kind of story? Ben listened to my story. Surely such a kind husband couldn't have been the worst kind of pickup artist. It must be some mistake. It'll probably turn into a funny story. That's what I thought. But wanting to be reassured, I opened my mouth. You know the station where we met, right? 
Apparently, there was this guy there who fell in love at first sight with younger girls and was hitting on them. Oh, and apparently he even married one of the girls he picked up there. I laughed after saying that, but Ben didn't laugh, just wanting to be reassured, I, feeling increasingly crushed by anxiety, trembled as I said, it's just a coincidence, right? You fell in love with me at first sight, right? My voice trembled more than I thought it would. Then, Ben suddenly burst out laughing as if he found it funny. Relieved for a moment, he laughed in front of me, trembling. Love at first sight, as if you were just the one who fell for it. Really, that coworker of yours shouldn't have said unnecessary things. You would have been happier not knowing. That's terrible. So you're saying you tricked me into marrying you? Was your love for me a lie? I raised my voice, unable to help it, as Ben continued to laugh as if it was funny. But Ben, uncaring of my feelings, added another cutting remark, it's your fault for being deceived. I wanted a young, stupid woman who would fall for a pickup. That's why I chose you. That remark was evidence that Ben was fully aware he had deceived me. Well, someone like you would have ended up with some terrible guy eventually. You should be glad you ended up with me. I've got work tomorrow, so I'm going to bed. And with that, he really laid down in bed. I think I was stupid too, but it was shocking to receive no support whatsoever. I had thought I was loved, but to realize it was all the same to him was unbearably frustrating. When we went to introduce ourselves for marriage, my in-laws said, we're relieved he's finally marrying and such a young girl too. We're delighted. I thought I was being praised, but probably Ben had been repeatedly told by his parents to get married. But now, knowing this truth, there's nothing I can do about it. Honestly, I no longer feel love, but it's not like our marriage is bad right now. And with our children at such a sensitive age, even if I wanted to divorce, I couldn't go through with it. The fact that I was mistaken about being loved and got married was sad and difficult, but I told myself I had to endure it. Yet, over time, I was able to come to terms with the past. The past is the past, I told myself, and even if there's no love for Ben, there's affection for the family life we've lived. After knowing the truth, our marriage couldn't be said to be good. Ben started avoiding me on his days off going to play pachinko. Yet, I no longer thought about wanting a divorce, and after quitting my part-time job, I started working from home, busily living each day. The kids grew up in no time and both found jobs in our hometown after graduating from college. Natalie later married someone from the same company. She had a child and now lives far away. Not able to see them often, but they're living happily as a family. The problem was Mark. After graduating from college, he quit his job. Soon after, that company wasn't for me, he said. The crappy boss kept dumping work on me. The part-timers are useless, just babbling away, he kept complaining. So at first, I simply thought it was a bad fit with the company or the boss. That's tough. Surely you'll find a company that suits you, Mark, I said. I even supported his job changes. Thanks to that, Mark changed jobs but quit again soon after. It was a repeating cycle. I lost track of how many times he changed jobs before turning 30. I wanted to defend my child, but him quitting jobs so quickly, it seemed like Mark was just being selfish, I thought. Full-time employment isn't for me. It's too much responsibility and the pay is low, Mark would say. I'm fine with part-time jobs. If a customer or the head office pisses me off, I can quit right away. Eventually, Mark, having resigned himself to this, is now hopping from one part-time job to another. Of course, that's not enough to cover his living expenses. He lives at home, not contributing to food or utility bills, and seems to use all his earnings as pocket money for himself. Mark, you're over 30. You can't live like this forever. I've tried to reason with him several times. Even if not a full-time job, at least a part-time one, no, even if it's just odd jobs, you won't see a raise if you don't stick with one place. Patience is important. But no matter how much I worry, it's like talking to a brick wall. 
As for Ben, he'd say, Well, don't say that. He's our son. We have no choice but to support him. Maybe that's fine for now, but doesn't he worry about our child's future? Dad really understands, huh? Mark would say. Spoiled by Ben, Mark seems to have no intention of stopping his odd job's lifestyle. Then at 34, Mark suddenly announced he was moving out, apparently planning to get married, and it seems he's found a full-time job. Actually, she's pregnant, so I've got to do my best, Mark told us. I was very happy, not just for Mark's independence, but also the relief that my worried son was getting married and the joy of having a grandchild. Mark's partner turned out to be Karen, seven years his junior. Since Ben and I also have a seven-year age gap, Mark laughed, saying, It's in the blood. So Karen came to visit our home. Nice to meet you, she said, bringing a cake from a shop Ben likes, perhaps Mark told her and her appearance was clean, making a good first impression. Karen, we're looking forward to having you. I greeted her with a smile, and Karen smiled back, but it wasn't a smile. I felt an odd sense of mockery in her smile and tilted my head in confusion. Huh. Oh, sorry, I just remembered that love at first sight story, she said. Contrary to my confusion, Ben and Mark started laughing uproariously. Yeah, the story of how mom got tricked. Really, Mark said. You already told her. I was so embarrassed, I could feel my face burning. But at the same time, a sense of loathing for the three of them welled up inside me. Karen laughed again triumphantly, as if she had won and turned to me. I'm loved by Mark, so no worries there. Is that something you say to someone who is going to be your mother-in-law, even if it's our first meeting? No, maybe she said it to assert dominance because I'm going to be her mother-in-law. Karen, you're funny and beautiful too. You must be popular, right? I said. If Dad has a daughter like Karen, he can rest easy then. That's great. I'll do my best to be a wonderful wife, Karen said. The three of them started chatting happily, leaving me out in the cold. But I didn't miss Karen looking down on me with a snicker. With Ben and Mark on her side, she acted as if she was superior to me. Mark and Karen got married and started living together in an apartment not too far from our house. Despite her being such a person, if Mark is happy, that's all that matters to me. They eventually had a beautiful baby girl, a healthy girl. I thought, now Mark really has to do his best. When an incident occurred, it happened one day when I returned from shopping for dinner. I heard a baby crying inside the house, thinking Mark's family had come over. I hurried inside, and as expected, Mark, Karen, and my granddaughter were there. Oh, you're here. You should have let me know, Mark said happily. I put down my bags and rushed to my granddaughter. Then Karen said to me in a chilly voice, Who are you? I was stunned by her words. I couldn't understand what was happening. Mark laughed heartily at her words. Amidst this, Ben said, seriously, starting today, my son, his wife, and their kids will live with me. We don't need anyone else. That's what we decided in the family. What from Ben's tone? It didn't seem like a joke. I don't know who you are, but old lady, get out of the house. We're going to work together as a family from now on, so please leave soon. We don't have room for you. My son and his wife dismissively said this while making gestures as if shooing me away with their hands. It was a misunderstanding to begin with, getting married and all. At Ben's comment, the three of them burst into laughter again, pushing my anger to its boiling point. I should not be ridiculed to this extent, no matter what. However, facing the three of them, I too let out a laugh finding it foolish to stand on the same stage, be provoked, and get angry with such people. After all, I'm paying $6,000 in living expenses, and they forget that and decide to kick me out. What are they planning to do going forward? Fine, I'll divorce you too, I said. I'll leave as you've asked. In my words, the three of them smirked with an unpleasant smile. I turned away and left the living room retreating to my own room. Your personal belongings are trash, 
Take them all with you, Ben yelled from the living room. Without responding, I silently started packing my belongings. The next day, I called the moving company. Given it was a weekday during the off-peak season, they said they could move my stuff that evening. Please, as soon as possible, I quickly responded, and it was decided that I would move out that day. I couldn't wait to leave this house, that was my sole focus. Watching me busily prepare to leave, Ben said with a laugh, A jobless old lady, where exactly do you plan on going? I might have forgiven you if you had apologized. I completely ignored his words. I didn't understand why I should apologize when there was no reason for me to. I'll be in the way of the move, so I might as well go to the casino, said Ben, having been continuously ignored by me, and left the house in the afternoon. Though I thought it would have been nice to hear even a single word of thanks, expecting anything from him was foolish. Well, goodbye then, I said, watching Ben's back as he left the house. A few hours later, thanks to the moving company, all my belongings were transported. I contacted the real estate agent to bring the keys immediately, moved everything in, and the move was complete. There's still a bit of unpacking to do, but I was relieved to have successfully moved. Now all that's left is to proceed with the divorce, and I will be officially free. Lying on the sofa in a liberated mood, my phone rang. It was Ben. Hello? I answered the phone. Ben yelled furiously from the other end. What do you mean by this? What are you thinking? His sudden loud voice made me instinctively pull the phone away from my ear. After a pause, I said, What? Why are you so angry? Don't play dumb. What kind of spite is this? You took all the furniture and appliances. The house is empty. I was puzzled by his words and slowly looked around the room. The furniture and appliances I brought from the house were all here, but there was nothing strange about that. What's wrong with that? You said not to leave my belongings behind. In other words, personal belongings, I clarified. You thought they were yours. I chose and bought them with my money. I laughed heartily. Ben, on the other end of the phone, couldn't say anything and let out a choked sound. Mark and Karen were there, so you got carried away and said such things about kicking me out, but you weren't seeing the reality. Well, I'll give you the appliances then, Ben said desperately, but I didn't miss his words. Give me? They were mine to begin with. Don't get ahead of yourself, I scolded. Ben fell silent again at my scolding. I could almost see his demeanor and nearly burst into laughter. Shut up. Anyway, this cuts all ties between us. Don't ever contact me again. And with that, he hung up the phone. It was funny that Ben, who had called me, forgot that he was the one who initiated the call. After being outwitted by me, I couldn't stop laughing alone in my new house. Though I didn't take his, don't contact me again, seriously, I still needed to get him to fill out the divorce papers, so I planned to contact him again. Annoying as it was, I intended to go back to the house the next day. As I left the office with a heavy heart, someone called out to me, stopping me in my tracks. Sarah, I knew it was you. Wasn't it, Rachel? It was Rachel with whom I had gotten along well when I was working part-time. Though I knew her contact information, we had only met a few times since I quit, and I hadn't seen her at all in recent years. But a reunion after so many years was a happy occasion. We decided to have coffee and went into a nearby cafe. After catching up on old times, Rachel said, Did you have some business there? I told her everything in response to her question. I shared that I was the one who had married the pickup artist Rachel had told me about, and how my husband, son, and his wife had kicked me out of the house. While I laughed as I told the story, Rachel felt down on my behalf. That's how it was. I'm sorry for saying too much. Rachel looked apologetic, but I was actually grateful. Indeed, it was a shock when I found out, and I was too embarrassed and ashamed to talk about it back then. But now I think it was good that I knew. I could have ended my life being ridiculed. My feelings about this are genuine. There were times I thought I would have been happier not knowing, but that's only if Ben had been capable of reflecting on his past. 
Given Ben's character, if I had remained ignorant, I would have been ridiculed even more. I'm able to take action now while I still have the energy, thanks to discovering Ben's true nature back then. By the way, Rachel, did you have some business here too? At my question, Rachel started speaking after a moment's thought. Actually, it's about my son, your son. I thought you had a daughter. After I quit my job, I had another child. I came here for a legal consultation about him. It turned out she was having trouble with her son's partner. Thinking that every family has its issues, we talked about various topics and then parted ways. When I returned home, my son's family was there, apparently moving in their stuff. Hey, you crazy old lady taking all the furniture and appliances, what's wrong with you? They really seemed intent on living together. The two glared at me as they came in. Where the large fridge used to be, there was now a small fridge that they must have used in their apartment. Its diminutive size made me burst into laughter inadvertently. What's so funny? Nothing. Heron seemed to understand why I laughed and snapped at me angrily. I elegantly dodged her attack and turned to Mark. Where's Dad? In the bedroom. The baby's sleeping, so don't make any noise, according to Mark. Ben seemed to be babysitting the granddaughter. He did take good care of the kids when they were young. Back when I still felt happy. With that memory in mind, I headed to the bedroom. I brought the divorce papers. Just fill them out and leave them. As soon as I entered the bedroom, I said that. Ben glanced at me and clicked his tongue. Standing up quietly, he was in the middle of cutting the baby's nails, having laid her down on the bed. My relaxing time ruined by this old hag, he muttered, complaining as he snatched the divorce papers from me. Ignoring Ben, I peered at my granddaughter's sleeping face. Though a child of my disappointing son, she was my blood-related granddaughter. There's no lie in saying she's adorable, but looking at her face with a smile, I felt a chill run down my spine. Her cute little face looked exactly like Rachel, whom I had just met. And then I remembered the story Rachel had shared earlier about her son's girlfriend getting pregnant, lying to scam money, and then disappearing. Just a few hours ago, I thought every family has its challenges upon hearing Rachel's confession. But could it be that Karen was the one who scammed money from Rachel's son? That's what crossed my mind. If my suspicion was correct, then this child might not even be Mark's. With a pale face contemplating this, Ben spoke to me. Here, I filled it out. Now get out, okay, and throw this away too. Well, you won't be seeing this kid again anyway, but you can keep it if you want. Ben handed me a tissue wrapped around the baby's nail clippings, along with the divorce papers. I took them without a word and left the house immediately. Then I hurriedly contacted Rachel again. A month later, my phone rang once more with Ben on the other end. Hey, I got a notice that the electricity and gas bills are unpaid. What's going on? Again, he raged one-sidedly, taking his anger out on me. I don't know. Pay it yourself. Where's the money? How were these bills paid before? Where's the bank card? I could hear him rummaging around, probably turning the house upside down looking for the bank book. Seeing Ben in a frenzy, I couldn't help but laugh. What are you laughing at? Get over here. You've made a mess, so I can't find anything in the house. After saying that, Ben hung up the phone. Though I wasn't keen on it, there was something I needed to do. Reluctantly, I got ready and called someone. That night, I rang the house's doorbell. You're late. What have you been doing, you freeloader? Seeing my face on the monitor, Ben rushed out of the entrance and froze upon seeing the person next to me. Who might this be? She's a friend of mine. It's been a long time, Rachel greeted him deliberately. However, Ben tilted his head in confusion. You don't remember the face of every girl you picked up, do you? Rachel laughed. I couldn't help but laugh along then, feeling embarrassed, glared at me. What kind of harassment is this, bringing a woman I hid on here thinking I'd be upset? I wouldn't do something so childish. 
I'm here to see Karen, I replied. Together with Rachel, I entered the house. As expected, the living room was occupied by my son and his wife. They seemed quite relaxed in a home without me. Seeing my face, they made it clear with their expressions that they thought I was a nuisance. But frankly, I didn't want to come either. So you must be Karen. Rachel began upon seeing Karen's face. Huh. Who are you? A friend of the old lady. Why are you bringing her here? She's a stranger. Karen retorted with disdain towards Rachel. Rachel looked incredulous but quickly responded. I've been looking for you. It was hard to find you since your last name changed. Hey, lady, what do you want with Karen? Mark stood up. Then Rachel handed Mark an envelope. Mark, puzzled, pulled out a document from inside. Tim Brown, who's that? What's this genetic research? Mark read the name on the document within. Tim Brown, Rachel's son's name. Hearing that name, Karen's face turned pale. She snatched the documents and envelope from Mark. What's this, Karen? You shouldn't look at someone else's mail. It's wrong. Her voice trembling. Karen likely knew who Rachel was and the content of that letter. We did a DNA test for my son and Karen's daughter. Ha, huh, your child is my son's child. Unfortunately, there's no blood relation with Mark. With Rachel's words, Mark turned pale and froze. Karen remained motionless, equally shocked. What do you mean? Ben, who had been silent, joined our conversation. I made good use of the granddaughter's nails you gave me. Yes, I had passed the granddaughter's nails Rachel gave me before to her, and I told her the granddaughter looked just like Rachel. It wasn't improbable for Karen, rude and deceitful, to scam someone for money, Rachel explained. Rachel discreetly sent the nails I provided and her son's toothbrush to a laboratory for testing, which confirmed a parental relationship. However, Rachel hadn't yet informed her son, knowing he would be extremely worried about the baby supposedly born. She wanted to assess the situation herself first to prevent her son from being shocked. That's not my child, it must be some mistake. Mark was devastated, pitiful. Thinking you were loved and being tricked into marriage, Rachel said to Mark the same words Karen had used on me. Being deceived into marriage by Ben, and now hearing those words directed at Mark, made me involuntarily smile. It wasn't my grandchild after all. Ben collapsed, shocked. The child will be taken care of by us. There will likely be a lawsuit. Wait, not that, please. How will you raise her? You're getting divorced, right? And you don't work right. You also have to return the money. Karen clung to Rachel's arm, crying. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Rachel spoke to Karen gently, trying to console her. You drove Sarah out and sneaked into this family with lies. Do you think you'll be forgiven, though? Rachel's tone was gentle, but the coldness in her words left Karen unable to retort, only to wail in response. And what about the bank? I turned back to Ben, who was in a daze, his eyes vacant. Before the granddaughter was born, Ben was overjoyed, calling her his inner grandchild, his hope for living. Now that is gone. I can understand the shock, but I had to confront him with an even harsher reality. The bank is only with you. There are no others. What? How did we manage the living expenses until now, the utility bills? There must be an account for living expenses. Ben sounded surprised. I was the one providing for the living expenses every month. Six thousand dollars. Of course, I have no intention of doing that any more. at my words. Mark also looked up. Ben's eyes darted around, unsettled. Six thousand dollars every month. Ben sounded surprised, as if he didn't know until now. Yes, didn't he know? Well, you just spent it however you liked. Ben looked up at the sky, perhaps reflecting on his actions, thinking he hadn't been caught. He had poured all the money he could freely use into gambling, and when that ran out, he secretly took from the food money. It wasn't once or twice that the money I set aside for payments disappeared. 
Thought you weren't caught. Your wasteful spending inflated our living expenses, in my words. Ben defiantly raised his voice. But there must have been a bank book with savings, like for bonuses, right? You took that years ago, all of it blown on gambling, don't you remember? Confronted with the truth, Ben looked startled, likely having forgotten. And he must have misunderstood that it still existed. I sighed in disbelief. I've been compensating for that with my own money without saying anything. Do you realize now how despicable you were to drive me out without knowing how much you depended on me? You better live without regret, liar. Where did a poor person like you get that kind of money? Ben yelled, refusing to accept the truth. It was pointless to argue. If you can't believe it, then fine. I then turned my gaze to Mark. And you, Mark? Mark, who had been disheartened by the situation with Karen and his daughter, looked at me with empty eyes. Hopping from job to job, never contributing to the household expenses, living off my money, and then driving me out. Have you ever thought about what happens next? Silence followed my question. You know Dad's savings are zero. He might be re-employed now, but considering his age, how long can he work? Mark seemed to grasp the gravity of the situation, trembling as if he had seen something terrifying. You might have thought returning home would save you living expenses like when you were single, but driving me out, you've made a huge mistake thinking life can go on as before, I continued. No one responded after that. Only Rachel patted my shoulder, satisfied. I felt fulfilled having said what I wanted and addressed her. Let's go home, right? Karen, I'll be in touch. As Rachel and I were about to leave, Mark called out, Mom, where are you living now? Living alone must be tough, right? You can come back. His smile was forced, calling me Mom for the first time in decades, clearly trying to appease me. His ulterior motive was transparent, and I responded with a slight smirk. Not at all. I'm living in a high-rise condo now. It's more comfortable than here, I stated. A high-rise condo? Yes, bought it for $2 million. Don't worry, if anything happens to me, I've arranged for everything to go to my daughter so Mark won't be burdened. Hearing the amount, Mark and Ben exchanged looks. Where did you get that kind of money? Are you really wealthy? Rachel tilted her head, puzzled. Didn't your family know you're a best-selling author? No, I never said that because they would just ridicule me. Turns out you got away with the biggest one. We laughed together, and Ben and Mark suddenly changed their attitude, trying to stop me from leaving. Sarah, I was wrong. You've been doing such incredible work, and I never understood. I'm truly sorry, please come back. Their sudden change of heart was nauseating. Both began to plead in soft voices, clinging to me. Do you think you can live in such a house, Mom? You're amazing. Come back home. If that's impossible, could you at least help with the living expenses, please? I was just deceived by that woman. It's sad, isn't it? Mark said, pointing to a disheartened Karen. Karen flinched, but it seemed like she no longer had the energy to fight, sitting next to her sleeping child without moving. I felt a bit sorry for her, but after all, it was her own doing and I had no intention of helping. Yes, being deceived into marriage is pitiful. I returned my gaze to Mark and said that. Well then, that's why you have to figure it out yourself, right? It's your fault for being deceived. With those words, I pushed Ben and Mark away. They must have realized they were abandoned by me, stunned. They slumped onto the sofa. See you then. I cheerfully bid goodbye and left the house. A family that had no interest in me, even when I said I was paying, they wouldn't believe me and treated me as poor. Even when I said I was working from home, they ridiculed me, saying working from home, really. They probably didn't know I was a novelist. Nor did they know about the royalties and real estate investments I made with that money. I couldn't care less about being praised for my work by such people now, nor did I want anything to do with them. Karen, who tricked me and got into the family with lies, and Ben and Mark, who kept belittling people, ended up losing their family money and hope. 
Maybe we were a family of similar kinds, I thought, laughing inwardly. Afterward, Karen and Mark divorced. Karen was kicked out but had nowhere to go, so she's apparently still living in the house temporarily. Ben and Mark, despite everything, couldn't bring themselves to throw out the small baby. Karen must be living there miserably. Mark eventually quit his job again. He thought he no longer had the duty to support a wife and child, but seems to have forgotten that he now has to support his father in that moneyless house. I wonder how the two will survive. I hope they reflect on their actions and live their lives accordingly. Later, Rachel and her son Tim sued Karen. Rachel is gearing up for parenting from scratch. It's enviable to have something to strive for at this age, but it reminds me that I too must keep working. I open my laptop. Maybe for my next book, I'll write about a woman who was deceived into marriage, but turns her life around and finds happiness. Watching the night view from my beautiful condo, that's what I thought.